Okay, bless the Most High Yah. This is Apostle Curtis Lewis coming in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the Living God. We are back here in the four walls of the house to do another Sabbath class. Amen. And I am going to uh, read the Ten Commandments, and my wife is going to come up and do the opening prayer. And we're going to come back and get involved in the lesson. Amen. I want to welcome those of you that uh, will be logging in with me on Facebook and later on tonight as I do a premiere on YouTube Live. Um, if you haven't taken the time to go to YouTube under Apostle Curtis Lewis, and I spell Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, please take time and do so and help me to share and spread the teaching of the word, especially if you've been blessed by it. And uh, so please subscribe to our channel on YouTube under Apostle Curtis Lewis. All right, the Ten Commandments, also known as the voice, Deuteronomy 4, verse 12. The Ten Commandments, throughout the scripture, also known as the covenant, in fact, it is the covenant, Exodus 34, verse 28. The Ten Commandments, also known as the faith. The faith, not faith as in believing or mutual faith. The faith. Uh, Romans 10, verse 17, and Jude uh, 1, verse uh, 1 down to verse 3. The Ten Commandments, also known as the law of love, the law of liberty. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 6, and Deuteronomy 4, verse 10 through 12. Okay, Exodus chapter 20, start at verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. Exodus 20 and verse 20 says this, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, or your faces, that you sin not. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgress also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. All of these blessed commandments can be found and taught throughout the New Testament from Matthew all the way to Revelation. Yeshua taught them, the apostles taught them, and he told the apostles, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you. God bless you. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Abba, Father, Yah, we come to you this day. Thank you and praise in your name for this time and for this Sabbath day and, being, and for being in the house and having a fellowship among the saints today to hear you with the word and the teaching that you would have us to know. Give us your understanding and not our own, O oh God. For we choose to understand the way, the word, the way that you meant for it to be understood and be imp implemented in our lives. In Jesus' name. 
So uh, bless the apostle today to, to give us the word the way that you desire for us to know it and the way that you put it in him and that we understand it the way that you've given it. In Jesus' name we pray, oh God. Amen. Amen. Okay. All righty. Now, uh, let me read my disclaimer. I love to read this because uh, I want to make sure everybody know where I stand, what I believe. Amen. Uh, especially about the fact of uh, the Negroes in this awakening and our revival, waking up, realizing that we're the descendants. Now, just because we're the descendants do not mean that's going to get you, automatically get you into glory. Amen, amen. But it's a blessing to know who you are and where you came from. Amen. So I like to read this disclaimer so people know exactly where I come, I'm coming from and I make no apologies for it. Amen. I say that in love. My disclaimer and love for all people. Greetings to everyone in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, a.k.a. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I am Brother Curtis Lewis, also known on Facebook and YouTube as Apostle Curtis Lewis. I am a born-again Messianic Israelite follower of Christ and the way as described throughout the scriptures. I believe the Almighty God is awakening a remnant out of all nations of the true scattered house of Israel in fulfillment of the prophecies of Ezekiel concerning the scattered dry bones according to Ezekiel chapter 37. <clears throat> Excuse me. I believe in these last days that the most high God is awakening for the most part the so-called African American Negro slave descendants to their true identity and their natural lineage to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe also there is an awakening of many Gentile believers to this same truth and that we all will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air at his return. <clears throat> it is my sincere desire and prayer that through the teaching of the word today and with the help of the Holy Spirit, that we all can be brought to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and fullness of the statue of Christ and to the love of the Heavenly Father. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Before I get started, uh, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Amen. I was getting ready to do one or two other things, but I, I, I sense the Spirit said, let's go and get into the lesson. Okay, I'm going to ask my wife, would you please uh, locate Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and verse 16. And I'm going to ask you to read that for me, and then I'll uh, get into my subject for the day, uh, then go on into the introduction of this lesson. So that's going to be Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and verse 16. Let me know when you're ready. <clears throat> Glory. Hallelujah. Got it? Okay. Read that for me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, verse 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, mm -hmm. but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. All right, beautiful scriptures. And from the, these two scriptures, I'm going to use as a subject, what does grace look like? What does grace look like? And I'm talking about when you look at somebody's life and their walk uh, and their profession as being followers of Christ, uh, what does grace look like? Amen. And so we're going to go through some scriptures today. In the last couple of Sabbaths, I've been dealing with uh, grace, and I've been dealing with mercy, and I've been trying to scripturally show the difference between the two, and I've also sought to prove that grace is not 
God's unmerited favor, even though that's what most of the church world say grace is, but that's not what the Bible described to be grace. So you don't have to go back to the other lessons to look at it, but uh, I've come to realize it's best that we let the Bible explain itself, interpret itself, opposed to someone else trying to explain it and interpret it and try to go outside of the Bible, get definitions and bring bring them back to the Bible and try to make the Bible say what your definitions say. That's how we get in trouble. And so, and I'm not saying some definitions are not wrong or, or not bad or not good, but that practice and depending on that practice is not always good. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So, subject, what does grace look like? Now, in my introduction, number one, beware of going outside of the Bible to explain the Bible. That's the first thing I want to talk about, and I kind of just touched on it. Beware of going outside of the Bible to explain the Bible. That has become a common practice. Now, I understand that People like to look at words and go back and look at the Greek and the Hebrew and go get definitions. And, and I know that that can help you to a certain degree. But there are so many ministers out here that do that that don't have the right motive. Now, I am not talking about the sincere, true shepherds of the Most High, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But we got to take in consideration that everybody that's doing that is not doing it for the right reason. And I've come to realize in the many years that I've been in, in life and in ministry, I have watched a lot of ministers take that verse or, or take or, or that practice rather, and they deceive people. So I believe that we need to go back to obeying what the word said, the scripture said, until I come take, uh, give attendance to read it. And I want to encourage uh, those of you that are born again and you've received the spirit of the most high uh, uh, into your life, you need to go back to just reading your Bible. It's already been translated from Greek and Hebrew. Amen. Amen. And they got several translations. And I believe that if you get your good translation, and you just read that Bible and you just trust the spirit, 1 John 2, 27, he will explain things to you. You do not need to depend on intellectuals and seminary trained people that go outside of this Bible and come back and try to make the Bible say what they found. That's deception. And a lot of people are doing that. I want you to get uh, Ephesians 4 verse, I think it's verse 14, huh? and I want uh, you to read that verse. Because my the, my the first thing in my introduction is beware of going outside of the Bible to explain the Bible. The scripture says, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you believe that this is the word of truth, then you need to just get back to reading it and rightly divide it, not rightly dividing definitions, sources, and different things outside this Bible. He didn't tell you to do it that way. And I'm just saying that that practice has become a way to trick people yeah. for the most part. So you got that scripture. I think it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, mm -hmm. tossed to and fro, mm -hmm. and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There is so many cunning and crafty people that stands in the pulpit teaching the Bible and they have taught things down through the ages. And it's just like Jude said, ungodly men was going to creep in, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And a lot of that stuff crept into the church and crept into the churches and people's lives. And I think we got to get back to the basics where your dependency and your trust is in the most high father and the leading of his spirit in your life. 
Now, uh, there again, I'm not saying throw away the good shepherds, because they got a lot of good shepherds that's not doing this stuff. But they got more bad shepherds out here twisting this Bible, and they, they want you to be dependent on their ability to explain this book, their ability and their intellect and their education in yeah. telling you what every scripture means. Run. That's what you need to do. Come on. <laughs> you need to run from them and come back to the basics because the bottom line is when you stand before the Almighty God, you're going to stand there by yourself and have to give an account, and you ain't going to be able to blame nobody but yourself because he will give you the spirit that will guide you into all truth. That's what I'm talking about. So there's a lot of people out here with sl slick hands, and they are able to twist these scriptures, and that's how we come up with this doctrine, can't nobody stop sinning. And none of the apostles ever said that. Jesus never taught that, and so that was just a wicked doctrine. And we got a lot of wicked doctrines in this Eurocentric uh, system that we all grew up in. So my first point under the introduction is beware of going outside of the Bible to explain the Bible. And... Um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You don't need, I had a, I had a brother on Facebook just a few minutes ago ask me to explain something to him. I said, I just read the scripture to you. If you don't listen to the scripture, you sure ain't going to believe me because the scripture is clear and expl it explains itself. This, this is the way some of these urban apologists and some of these intellectuals and some of these smart, uh, what do they call it, critical thinking preachers have crept into the church and they make this thing complicated. We need to come back to the simplicity that is in Christ. We don't need your complicated thoughts and your complicated exegesis of the scriptures. We just need to come back to the simplicity Amen. of reading these scriptures and trust in the lead of the Spirit in our lives. Glory to God. So, just knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. The Scripture don't need me to privately interpret it. It don't need a, any minister or any school or any seminary to interpret it. It interprets itself. It defines itself. Even this translated I'd use the King James. I'll, I'll read a few other ones, but I still like the King James because that's the one I'm comfortable with. But even this King James or any other good translation, it, the Word of God is wise enough to interpret itself. Even the people who translated it wasn't wise enough to hide what the Most High didn't want them to see. Amen. So he's smarter than everybody. So this book interprets itself. So we don't need nobody to interpret it. And John 5, 39 says, search the scriptures. It didn't say search sources. It didn't say search de uh, definitions. And everything is defined in the book. It says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Okay, number two. In my lesson, uh, in my lesson two weeks, uh, two messages, um, uh, the last two messages I was dealing with grace uh, when we go to the Bible you'll see that the Bible defines grace itself let me say that again in my last couple of messages that I dealt with if you notice we went to the scriptures and we allowed the scripture to define what grace is and what mercy is Glory to God. Now, number three, in this lesson, today, I want to go further into the scriptures to see what grace looked like so we can easily identify it. Amen. We should be able to look at a person's life. Amen. And Paul said you're supposed to be living epistles, seen and read of all men. If somebody can't look at your life and see Christ, Amen. First, how can they look at what you're saying and see Christ? Amen. So we ought to be able to look at a person's life and we ought to be able to tell whether they're walking in the grace of God. Because that's what the apostles did. The apostles said we beheld his glory. And John said we handled him, we touched him. And uh, they said he was full of grace and truth. And then the Bible said of his fullness he gave to us 
grace for grace. So these apostles was able to look at him and behold him and identify what grace was. So that should be the same with our lives. That people should be able to look at our life, look at what we say, and they should be able to see grace. Glory to God. Not see somebody saying, I got unmerited favor and sinning like a, a natural man that never met God. You ought to be able to look at you and see Christ. Amen. That's what we're talking about. All right. Now I want to go back to any comments before I move on. Any bang him? Okay. Now I want to go back. I want to get into the meat of the message. And I want to use my text again that my wife read. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Thank God because that's mercy. I thank God he had mercy on my life. If you're living today and you're still breathing, that's mercy. He's having mercy on you. Uh, when he's uh, got his grace upon your life, his grace brings you into living like him. His mercy gives you space and time while you're not living like him. Mercy is unmerited, not grace. Okay, so it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That's the purpose for all the sons of God, to be without sin. Amen. Because he was the first of many brethren. It was not the father's intention to have, only have one son not sinning. Amen. Uh, so it's his desire to have other sons looking like this son, his only begotten son. Okay. So again, for we have not a high priest, we cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, no matter where you are in your life. Maybe you are not where this message is, but no matter where you are, you ought to at least get the message and start pressing your way towards him. So it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. He said on the throne of grace, or you can say a throne of glory. Or you can say a throne of power. All of that's grace. Amen. So let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy. You obtain mercy. And whenever, whenever you obtain mercy, you find grace. You find grace to help in the time of need. Now I want to bring this out. And I was looking in the Old Testament. And uh, if you go type that word grace in in the old, uh, and you look at it when it was first mentioned, all the way through the Bible, you, 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 you'll notice that grace always had to be found. And I didn't know, I didn't know that until I was looking at all the scriptures in the Old Testament. And most of the time when it mentioned grace, grace have to be found. So what happened is, uh, you may be in a place where it's not good, but God's still having mercy upon you. But the reason you can't move beyond mercy is because you don't want to find grace. You want to misdefine grace. You want to take what the world say grace is and stay right where you are. Now, if that's not you, to God be the glory. But there's some people, they don't want to find grace. They, they, want, they want to find what has been perverted to be grace. Yeah. They don't, because, huh? they don't want to work for anything. They don't, they don't want to do nothing. See, I heard a minister teaching last night, and all he's teaching is unconditional eternal security. In other words, you ain't got to do nothing. You, you, all you got to do is just believe, and you're going to make it in, even if you die sinning. A lot of people are going to end up in the lake of fire behind that doctrine. Unconditional eternal security. And it's just a big lie. But... Most people want to remain right where they are with the mercy of God and call the mercy of God grace. Because <laughs> they've been taught grace is just unmerited, God merited faith. He see me righteous even though I'm unrighteous. I'm sinning, but he still see me righteous. So they want to stay right there and they are in a place where they're going to bust the leg of fire wide open. You in mercy. Mercy is sustaining you. It's of the Lord's mercies. And we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He's having mercy on people. But you've got to find grace 
while you're in that mercy. And a lot of people don't want to find grace because real grace bring you out of that sinful lifestyle, make you live like Christ lived with the grace that was on him. Hallelujah. So this scripture says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Do you really want to find the real grace? Or do you want to stick with your perverted uh, Eurocentric doctrines? Do you want to stay right where you are? Or do you want to find the grace that rested on our Savior and made him do always those things that please the Father? Wow. A lot of people just don't want to find this grace. They want to please themselves. They want to the please themselves. They want to please flesh. They want to have an excuse that this is why I do what I do, but that ain't going to hold water. So come boldly to the throne of grace, and you'll obtain mercy, but you have to find grace. And what will grace do? Help in the time of need. Grace is help. Grace is help. Grace is divine influence, divine power of God to help you do what Jesus said. Luke 646, why did you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? What are some of the things he said? If you love me, keep my commandments. And Christ didn't make no commandments because he went on to say, even as I kept my father's commandments. So the law of Christ is the father's commandments. Preachers got that wrong. And they want to teach it wrong because it makes them feel comfortable where they are and they have deceived a lot of people as if you ain't got to keep no commandments ain't no law, we ain't under law you don't understand what Paul was saying and you're wrestling with these scriptures to your own destruction because 1 John verse 2 verse uh, 3 and 4 said this is how we know we know him when we keep his commandments he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him I didn't say that. I didn't write the Bible. I just preach it. Amen. So, when you come boldly to the throne of grace, you will obtain mercy and find grace. And what will grace do? Help. Help in the time of need. Grace is help out of your situation. But a lot of people don't want to find this true Bible grace. They don't want to get out of that situation. They're comfortable with doing what they're doing and think they're going to have an excuse when the trumpet blow, but you're not. Okay, number two. I'm in my message now. This is number two in my message. The subject, again, is what does grace look like? Amen. Since the Bible has defined grace, what does grace look like? Let's see. Let's read some other scriptures and see can we see what grace looked like in the life of a person. All right. First time grace shows up uh, in my Bible is Genesis 6, verse 8. Genesis 6, verse 8 and verse 9. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it's interesting to me, and I think some of y'all ought to do the same thing. And you go look up grace throughout the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament. But when I looked it up in the Old Testament, I started seeing that. Every time grace is mentioned, it, somebody found it. Mm -hmm. Even when it comes to humans, they have to find grace. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the Father, you have to find grace. It's like grace is so valuable, you have to want this. Yeah. You have to look for this. Put forth an effort. Huh? You put forth the effort. They say it ain't no effort. It's unmerited. That ain't what the Bible teach. Yeah. The Bible said, humble yourself. It said, he resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. So that's something you have to do. You have to humble yourself, empty yourself, deny yourself of your pride to get grace. But they're trying to tell us, oh, he's just slapping on you, it's free of charge. This is just, well, it's free, but it ain't that free that you do nothing. <laughs> you know, it seems like the, the world don't want to find this precious commodity. <laughs> they don't want this. Amen. Huh? That's why I'm Few there be that find it. People don't really want to find this. They want to believe what they've been taught grace is. Opposed to finding this precious substance of the Most High Yah that empowers you to look like his son. Yeah, that's why people are going to walk that, 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 that narrow, narrow path. path. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. 
So what does grace look like? Uh, Genesis 6 and 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, he found grace. But let's keep reading. Uh, verse 9. These are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man. So when you find grace, it empowers you to be a just person. It empowers you to be right before God. So Noah was a just man and a perfect man in his generation. And Noah walked with God. So how, did, how was Noah able to do this? He found grace. And it made him different from his generation. It made him a just man. It made him a perfect man. It caused him to walk with God. And let me give you a confirming verse. So you won't think I'm making this up. The Bible explains itself. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. All right? For the grace of God. This is what Noah found in the eyes of the Lord. So, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Notice it bring his salvation has appeared to all men. That in, wouldn't that include Noah? Amen. Okay, this grace I'm talking about would include Noah and everybody else that find it. So it said, for the grace of God that bring his salvation has appeared to all men. Watch this. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the grace that Noah found Back when everybody was wicked, taught him to be different. And that's why the Bible said Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. That's what the grace of God looked like. Let's go somewhere else. Hallelujah. Psalms 84 verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Now, now, now we, we studied that, uh, that the Bible says that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that he was full of grace. And that of his fullness, all we received uh, was grace for grace. And then the Bible says that of his fullness, they begin to receive what he had in him. And John said, as we behold him, we behold this glory that was on him. So the uh, another word for the grace of God is the glory of God. <laughs> the power of God. The divine influence of the spirit of God. That's another definition, according to the Bible, of grace. So, here in this verse, in Psalms 84, verse 11, it says, For the Lord is a sun and a shield and will give grace and glory. So why did he put glory along with grace? Because when you got the grace of God upon you, you will see the glory of God on you. they they inseparable. Hallelujah. So he said, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Okay, so grace, what does grace look like? An upright life. Okay. <laughs> Not falling down, getting up. Not sinning uh, every day. Can't stop sinning. Nobody will ever conquer sin. That's not grace. Amen. That's the grace that was twisted. Okay. Ungodly men snuck in and turned the grace of God, the glory of God, in something less than what these apostles was talking about. Hallelujah. Let's go to Zacharias. 12 verse 10. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. So the Holy Spirit is known as the spirit of grace. And here's a prophecy that he's going to pour upon his people the spirit of grace and supplication. Now, let's go to Hebrews. I know I'm going fast here, but I got all mine written down. And uh, if I need to stop, just stop me. And if you need to make a comment, just uh, chime in. All right, Hebrews 10, 29. So here's a prophecy in the Old Testament that he's going to pour out upon uh, his people and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. So let's, let's go see this prophecy being fulfilled in the New Testament. In Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much so a punishment suppose ye 
shall be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. So over in Zechariah, the prophecy said he's going to pour out the spirit of grace. Over here we see the spirit of grace has been poured out and we see a group of people who had the spirit of grace, but now they done went back to their old ways and have done despite to the spirit of grace. And the Bible said they deserve more punishment than the Old Testament people that do such things like that. So if you pull the blood of Christ down to the blood of bulls and goats, you deserve more punishment than the Old Testament people. Because this spirit of Christ or the spirit of grace will cause you to live above the Old Testament people. Glory to God. Well, you don't have to offer and get up every morning repenting for something you did. Amen. Of course, if you've done something wrong, you should repent. But the Bible says this. Go find Hebrews 6 verse 1 for me. See, because some people say, well, just live a repentant life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, that sounds pretty, but see, that's a trick in and of itself. Why you got to live a repentant life if you're not uh, doing something wrong? Again, if you've done something wrong, yes, repent and get it right. But living a repentant life, watch this. Uh, Hebrews 6, verse 30, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Okay, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. Let us go on unto perfection, meaning we can go on. Go ahead. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So so, so that was kind of like a trick. Just live a repentant life and you'll be all right. Uh-uh. Bible said not to live again the repentance from dead work. Stop doing it. <laughs> Amen. And if you stop doing it, you ain't got to keep repenting. Glory to God. So these are, these are a lot of trick doctrines that we think is innocent. But what it does is it takes us away from the purity of the message. Amen. And you'll never produce someone living and walking just like the Savior. Because there's too many doctrines that roar the standard that the Savior set in place. Amen. So, my point in reading Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 is to show that the prophet prophesied that he's going to pour out the spirit of grace upon the uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Of course, this is talking about a prophecy to come. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that he said he promised the spirit of grace. Now, over here in Hebrews, I'm showing you where the spirit of grace did show up. Okay? So, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. What am I talking about? Uh, what does grace look like? Let's read some more scriptures to see if we can see what grace looked like when it, in somebody's life. Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 28. It says, wherefore we receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Let us have grace. Not this stuff that they told us was what grace was, unmerited favor. Uh, we talk about the grace that was in the Lord Jesus. That grace we're talking about. So it says, wherefore we receive in the kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Whereby we may serve God acceptably. What does grace look like? An acceptable life. That makes sense? It looks like an acceptable life. It looks like a life that God can say I'm pleased with. That's the real grace of God. Let me give a confirming verse. Romans 12 verse 1. <clears throat> I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, uh, the Bible said, for by his mercy he saved us. The first initial snatching from sin and salvation is mercy. And once you've been born again, born again comes with the grace of God. But you need to find it. You need to access it. You need to understand it. The reason people can't understand it and can't access it because they got the wrong understanding of what it is. And you access is something you've been taught that the scriptures don't teach. Glory to God. So it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, since mercy brought you in, by his mercy he saved us, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And this is how the living sacrifice sacrifice is supposed to look. Holy, acceptable. If the father didn't take lambs that had spots and blemish, blemishes in the Old Testament, how do you think he's going to accept some body with spots and blemishes, sins and, and, and wrinkles in the New Testament? Come on. Because we're covered by the blood. Okay, that's a good point. We're covered by the blood. But wait, the Bible said the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. So if you're really covered by the blood, and you should be, that means you cleansed from all A-L-L, sin. So why are you still sinning? <laughs> the message is wrong. It's what I'm after. The grace we've been accessing has been wrong. Now it's time to access, access the true grace Hallelujah. of God, which is the glory of God Hallelujah. and the power of Christ Lord. that rests on your life and cause your life to be acceptable to the Father. Okay. Hallelujah. So Hebrews 12, 28 says, Wherefore receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. What is acceptable? That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, holy as God of sin. You can't have one sin and be holy, period. Everybody know that. Common sense should tell us that. So what is acceptable life to the Father? That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service, amen, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? This is why people don't want to believe in perfect, and we're not talking about this human perfect stuff. We ain't talking about somebody humanly perfect. We ain't talking about somebody infallible as, they, as if they don't make human error. Okay. We're talking about somebody perfect in godliness, perfect in holiness, clean living, moral living, and got the spirit of God in you. That's what we're talking about. So that's why people don't want to find this kind of grace. Amen. Because that other grace allow you, you think, to be acceptable to God and think you're going to make it in, but you're not. And to keep sinning. And to keep sinning. The Bible says that when he come, he coming for a church without spot, wrinkle, wrinkle, or any, any such thing. That don't look like I can't stop sinning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's keep going. All right, Romans chapter 4. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. I'm teaching on what does grace look like? Grace look like a just man. <laughs> grace look like a perfect man in his generation. Grace look like Noah. Noah walked with God. Hallelujah. Grace look like a living sacrifice. Grace look like holy, acceptable. That's what grace look like. So if you don't look like this, guess what? You ain't got God's grace. Come on. You got a twisted grace. Hallelujah. Okay. So it says because, uh, let me go back. Uh, uh, Romans 4 verse 15. Because the law uh, worketh wrath, or where no law is, there is no transgression. Now I'm going into another thought pattern, so follow me here. Okay, but anyway, I was just talking about uh, what does grace look like. I'm describing what grace looks like when grace is in your life and on your life. Amen. And this is what the Bible says. Now, either we're going to believe people, uh, past teachings, or we're going to believe this, this Bible. Okay. This is what grace looks like. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Now, I'm, I'm going to shift here and go somewhere else and show you something. Now, I'm going to read this again. Romans 4, verse uh, 15 and then uh, just a town find uh, Romans uh, 4 verse 16 and Christy yes, sir. you find Genesis 26 verse 5 okay and then I'm going to read Romans 4 verse 15 again alright and I'm kind of going into another uh, going into another thought pattern okay Romans 4 Verse 15. But I'm still on the same message. 
Romans 4 verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath. Now, okay, I, I want to stop right here. Because see, a lot of people misunderstand this verse right here. So, I kind of want to kind of join y'all thinking for a minute. Because the law worketh wrath. Can anybody speculate what that might mean? Anybody? Speculate. What that what is he saying? The law worketh wrath. Now watch this. If the father say, uh, don't steal, how is that working wrath? <laughs> See, you got it. I think you got it. How does that work? Okay, if he say, if he say, uh, love you and honor your mother and father, how's that working wrath? But right here, this verse says the law worketh wrath. Because you can't do what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my point. Here's my point. When people teaching against the law in the New Testament, they got to know what law they're talking about. They, they, they all understand there's different groups of laws throughout the Bible. Okay? Now, the first law that was established on Mount Sinai was what? The Ten Commandments. That came out of the Father's mouth. That was not designed to work well. It was just simply designed to be God's uh, law of righteousness, his expectation, and he would have, if they opened their heart, he would have helped them and empowered them, but they didn't want to die. But then, as he was speaking these Ten Commandments, what they said, no. we're going to die. That was the purpose. He was going to kill you so you can live in him. Come on. Yeah. That was a, they was dying. When, remember when they said, we're going to die. They was literally dying. Every time the father spoke, they died. He was killing them. They were dying to themselves, and they felt it. But that was the father's purpose, to kill you that you might live in him. <laughs> but my point is this. When this verse said, because the law worked at the wrath, what is he talking about? When they broke that simple, righteous law that the father spoke, when it says he added no more, when he started adding all these laws, that's what worked the wrath. The schoolmaster and especially the Moab law that they could not keep and did not keep worked the wrath against them. But God's words don't work no wrath. No. And so preachers got this wrong and they don't know what they teach it. They don't understand the Moab laws, the schoolmaster laws, and the, the oracles of the Father. They don't understand all of that. So when they're trying to teach this, they'll put a bad taste in your mouth about God's laws, but they don't have a clue what this book is saying. That's why Peter said, Paul says some things hard to be understood, which them that wrestle, or they wrestle to their own destruction, because they don't understand what Paul is teaching. I heard one last night, and I'm like, Lord, help me. And I sent him an email. In fact, I'm going to read that email. Let me take a little side journey. I read that email. Because I love these guys. I'll be trying to help them. I sent him. I ain't going to call his name. I ain't got that name called the Spirit right now. If I get it, I'll let y'all know. But I just want to read y'all this. How people just screw up the Word of God, screw up the teaching of the Word, and think they know what they're talking about. So I wrote him this letter. I ain't going to call his name. My friend, I listened closely to your message on last night, Friday evening, 8, uh, 5, 22. And I must say, that uh, I believe you got a good heart and you mean well, but your whole perspective of the Holy Scriptures is completely off and in error. <clears throat> what you are teaching comes from a Eurocentric perspective. Therefore, you are following your European church fathers. No offense to anybody, just telling the truth. You are following your European church fathers. The true church fathers was Hebrew Israelites who wrote the scriptures. You do not understand the difference between, number one, the faith and mutual faith. Because he had that all jumbled up. And if you don't unjumble this stuff, you cannot teach the word of God accurately. Yeah. You do not understand what Paul was talking. If you don't understand the faith and mutual faith, two different things in the scripture. Number two, the law of God and the Moab laws, schoolmaster law, forward slash schoolmaster law. So I went on to tell him, I said, until you get these 
things straight, you will remain confused and you will keep misleading the people. I used to teach what you are teaching, so I include myself, okay? And I'm only trying, as an elder, I'm trying to help people. I ain't going to leave this earth having kept quiet when I saw people messing up folks Amen. and mess up themselves. Amen. That's why I do Amen. what I do. Amen. Okay, until you get these things straight, you will remain confused and you will keep misleading people. I used to teach what you are teaching for over 20 years. So I know exactly what you are saying. You are teaching unconditional eternal security. Because I talked to him on the phone and he admitted to this. And unconditional eternal security means do nothing. You ain't got to do nothing. And you will make it in even if you die sinning. That's what he's teaching. That's what they taught us. And that's what he was teaching. And he admitted it to me. So since I looked back in on him and saw him still teaching, I figured I'd just give him a confirming verse. At least... When he stands before God, he can't say something I didn't try to tell him. Okay? My friend, that teaching is going to land many people in the pit of hell. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you will not be able to say no one tried to warn you. I know you more than likely will reject what I'm telling you, but the old folks used to say, a hard head will make a soft butt. Shalom. <laughs> now, I was getting ready to do this early, but this is the proper time for it. Let me go on and do this, then I get back to my message. And I only probably got about 10 more minutes of my message to go, I hope. Yeah, about 10 more minutes, and I'll be finished with my message. But let me throw this in. And I did this post this morning. Things that must... I'm sorry, things you must understand when studying the Bible or you will not completely understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. Hold up. Number one, the difference between the faith and mutual faith. I just told him that in that letter. And a lot of ministers that teach the word don't understand this. Now don't get mad at me because I understand it and the Father taught me I'm not trying to say I know more than anybody. I'm not trying to say I know more than you guys that may be listening to me. I'm just telling you before I die, somebody tried to tell y'all about this. Now, if you don't change after you hear this, I'm released. The blood ain't on my hand. Okay? So that's why I do what I do, you all. And I ain't finna die no time soon, I don't think. <laughs> but I want to make sure as an elder, I don't watch these young ministers and try. These young ministers are messing people's lives yes. up, a lot of them. Hallelujah. So, things you must understand when studying the Bible or you will not completely understand the Bible. Number one, the difference between the faith and mutual faith. Two different things throughout the scripture. Number two, the difference between the laws of God himself and the schoolmaster laws forward slash the Moab laws. All right? Number three. These are things you must understand and get straight. Otherwise, you, you don't completely understand the Bible. Number three. The difference between the works of the law and the works of righteousness. Also, obedience. Like Jesus said in uh, Matthew 5, 16, uh, it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father. Well, when you go to Ephesians, we're not saved by works. There's two types of works. And so if you don't rightly divide and understand the difference between works and the works of the law and the works of righteousness, you are confused yeah. teaching the Bible. Right. Number four, <clears throat> the difference between the righteousness of faith, the righteousness of faith, and the, the law for righteousness. Two different things. And if you don't get it, you don't completely get the Bible. Yeah. And you will see these terms throughout the Bible. All right. Number five, the difference 
between the chosen people of Yah. Yah chose a people in the earth. Now, I know a lot of folks don't like that, and especially with this awakening, and we're teaching about all these promises that was made to these bloodline chosen people, and a lot of people in Christendom don't like to hear it, but you don't like the Father. Because even though Paul said we are one, that is not saying that there's not a people in the earth called his chosen people. Yeah. So if you don't understand the difference between the chosen people of Yah and the grafted in people of Yah, you don't understand your Bible and what you're teaching. Clearly. Okay, number six. The difference between works, I just kind of text on that, works, W-O-R-K, and works. Two complete different things. So when you read the scripture that not of works, at least any man should boast, that's another works that you can boast in in Christ. Hmm. Bible said I make my boast in him. Amen. Okay, so if you don't understand that, you can't completely teach the Bible with clarity. Okay, number seven. The difference between the change of the priesthood and the change of the law. This is where a lot of the Israelites mess up at and get to Judaizing. Because they don't understand that Messiah brought about a change of the priesthood and a change of the law. So, things you must understand when studying the Bible or you will not completely understand the Bible. I'm just sent by the Most High to teach this. Don't get mad at me if you're a theologian and you don't know this. Then the Bible said he chose the simple things of the world and the foolish things of the world to confound those of you that think you wise. So don't get mad if you don't understand these things. Just do 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. You cannot rightly divide the word of truth if you don't have a clear understanding of these things I've mentioned that's in the Bible, the Bible the Scripture. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, which means Peter read all of Paul's epistles, speaking in things of the speaking to them in uh, of these things in which some things hard to be understood. Some things Paul teach Peter said hard to be understood, mm -hmm. which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Amen. The brother I wrote the letter to that I was listening to last night, so convinced that he know what he's talking about. And he do not understand Paul. And he wrestling with the scriptures to his own destruction. He's going to destroy himself and the people that hear it. But it's like we were saying earlier today that there are those people who don't want to know. They don't want to know, just like some of them don't want to know this real grace and what it really does in your life. Their thing is that they, I mean, they, they may understand completely what you're saying, but mm -hmm. they prefer to just go with what they believe. Mm -hmm. And like Jimmy Swaggart said, y'all better hope I'm right. <laughs> right. Jimmy Swaggart here in this city, uh, he, I've been on top of that case for a long time. I done had encounters with Donnie Swaggart, and Donnie Swaggart did a 45-minute broadcast on me trying to disprove what I'm teaching and couldn't. But, and that was years ago, but anyway, Jimmy Swaggart, the stuff he teach, he had to come out and say, yo, but I hope I'm right. Wait a minute. Well, I, I hope you're right. I know you're wrong on some things. Mm -hmm. And he basically teaching that you can't stop sinning. Everybody goes sin and no such thing as sinless perfection. And he said cross, 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 but he's talking about the cross where you can't stop sinning. I preach the cross that can deliver you from sin. Oh, <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, um, I mean, why do we have the hope yeah, well, you question. can know these things I've written unto you that, you know, so, so that you'll know. Mm -hmm. You can know. 
You got to hope and guess at eternal life. No, that you may know you have eternal life. And have faith that God can keep you and that God raises you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I was watching, uh, remember that set down we had here, all three of us, uh, me and David and uh, Melba, and all y'all came up, and y'all did have some powerful testimony. Judy, you said that on there, and I said, Judy, you can <laughs> preach it up here in a few minutes. <laughs> it seemed like they don't have the faith that the most high power can work in flesh, just like he worked in Jesus' flesh. They, they don't believe that. Well, it's like he's saying that he didn't, it, he's living through his past mistakes. So right. he's preaching his past mistakes mm -hmm. as though it's a doctrine. He made up a doctrine because and, made, and changed the whole Bible. Yeah, because <laughs> of how he failed. And you ain't going to live in the same city with me and I ain't going to say something. I don't care how big you are, I'm going to say something to you. And I did. Still love him to this day. So and I used to attend them too for years ago. That's what. So that's what they're doing. Those people that are doing that kind of stuff. I mean, they're yeah. they're living through their mistakes and teaching mm -hmm. through what they failed at. Right. They're teaching through their the, the lens of their failures, but they're supposed to teach through the lens of Christ's victory. Yeah. That's the problem. If you don't preach it, you, won't you don't preach it. You won't preach it. <laughs> I told somebody this morning, I had a brother call me and said, he'd been following me a while, looking at, listening to all my messages, and he heard that, that thing we did, you know, uh, with Elder Mike, that, that you know, y'all know what we did. Yes. He finally admitted, he said, man, Elder Mike is wrong, and you were spot on. He said, he really is, let me just stop. Well, he really twisted the scriptures. Amen. And testified, can't stop sinning. Amen. So people are beginning to call because they getting it. Yeah. Amen. I ain't going to change. I don't care how many twos you got in your chat. I'm going to stay a one in your chat. <laughs> Amen. But here's a scripture that just came to my mind because here's one of the uh, reasons why people make excuses. And I, I just heard that in my spirit while we was talking. I just heard somebody in social media say this in my spirit. You know, spiritual things are real. And I just heard somebody say, no one will of the foul body. As long as you're in these bodies. Let me show you something about this body. Come on. Hallelujah. What, what, the, what Yeshua did to your body when you got saved. Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And all things are of God. All things. Amen. Day one. <clears throat> now. If I would have known back then what I know now, chances are is I wouldn't have to go through all that falling down and getting up. Because the Bible says in Luke 1, verse 73 down to verse 75, that he will deliver us from our enemies and we can live in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. Amen. Anybody ever tell you that day one, uh, Tammy? I probably should have told you because I didn't know it back then. <laughs> but nobody told me that. But it's in the Bible. Yeah, amen? And some people think, well, we saved with these bodies. These bo Let me show you what he did to your body. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he said, And the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, let me show you another verse in Colossians. Because see, they put it on the body. Mm -hmm. I think it's Colossians chapter 2. Let's go to verse uh, 9, maybe, I think. No, I'm going to start at verse 10. Shut the devil down. Amen. Right fast. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you take your body and go sin, yes, it's foul. Mm -hmm. And uh, been defiled. But thank God for his mercy. If you're still breathing, he can clean you up again. Amen. Man, I had to, I've been there. So I'm not downing anybody. I'm just trying to say you ain't got to stay there. Okay. Colossians 2 verse 10. And you are complete in him. This is, the, this is the real encounter with Christ called the new birth when you're born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things become new. All things of God. And you ain't got no sin nature dwelling in you no more. Yeah. Period. You have to be quicker to work dead and trespasses and sin wherein in time past 
You walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and you were by nature. You ain't got that nature no more. You ain't got no sin nature. You ain't got no nature that, that drive you to sin. What driving you to sin is your choices. <laughs> Colossians 2 verse 10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised. Watch this. He's going to show you what he circumcised. Circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And let me show you what circumcision he's talking about. In putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He cut all the sin out of you. He cut sin nature out of you. Your body became the temple of the Holy Ghost or the Ruach HaKadosh. The day you was born again, your body is holy, not vile. If it's vile, you sin. You went back. And the Bible said, uh, stand fast, therefore, the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not again entangled with the yoke of bondage. Ephesians 5, verse 3 said, let all uncleanliness, all fornication, let it not be once named among you. Hallelujah. These are scriptures they didn't tell us. We learn Eurocentric doctrine. Our oppressors want us to always break God's commandments because as long as we break God's commandments, we're going to remain scattered in these nations. That's why we scattered on slave ships now. Because our ancestors broke these commandments. Hallelujah. But we ain't breaking them no more. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I ain't going to let you fool me no more. All right, let me finish this message up. What am I teaching on? What does grace look like? Look just like Noah, a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Why? Wow, because Noah found this grace. What does grace look like? It looked like Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. This grace that we're talking about, whereby we may serve God acceptably. What does an acceptable life look like? It looked like Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Yah, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable if you done met it. Your reasonable service that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Hebrews said, let us receive grace so we can serve him acceptably. What is acceptably? Living holy, acceptable, and that you can prove what is that good, perfect will of God. That's what grace looks like. I'm killing that old definite unmerited faith who just can't stop sinning. He's going to give it to you even though you're unrighteous. Lie. Come on now. Okay? So, why did I go to Romans? It says, because the law worketh wrath. What law? The ones that they added for breaking God's commandments. Hallelujah. It worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Now, the urban apologists and Christendom in this Western Christianity, which is a religion, of white supremacy. No, 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 no indictment on anybody, just supposed to the truth. Uh, it says we ain't under, we ain't got no more laws. God did away with his laws. Find that scripture. He ended the Moab law, curse of the law. He never ended law. You don't find no scripture in the Bible that God ended law. But yet they taught us. That we, we, he did away with his law. The Bible said where no law is, there is no transgression, there ain't no sin. Is there sin in the world? There's sin everywhere, isn't it? So there got to be some law still here somewhere. Right. Right. <laughs> you feel to say something? <laughs> so these are trick gospels that they taught us that we coming back and we disputing them and we casting out these evil mindsets and these evil teachings that we once was taught that kept us breaking God's commandments. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Romans 4 verse 16. I, told, I gave them to y'all to read, but I'm not here. That's all right. I'm going to read them now. <laughs> okay, Romans 4 verse 16. Therefore, 
It is a faith that it might be by grace. Here's why I went here. And this is a whole nother lesson. I'll prove this later. He said, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. It is a faith that it might be by grace. You cannot find this grace if you're not operating in the real faith. The faith. That's why people can't find this true grace that I'm talking about. Because they're not operating in the faith. Let me tell you what faith I'm talking about. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the problem is people aren't born again. That's one of the biggest problems that they're not born again. Well, let me go ahead. Go ahead. Keep talking. No, only be, I was thinking that because uh, people, you know, I, I, they, they live in sin. They want to live in sin. They keep falling down and, and getting up and repenting. You know, you have to live a repentant life because you can't help but sin. These people aren't born again. These people now, are now the sin. majority of them, I don't think is born again. But I will say some of them may be born again because I used to teach that repentant life too. And I taught it when I was born again, but I taught it through ignorance. So I was born again and teaching it. So some of them are born again, they just throw it in that ignorant doctrine. But some of them, you're right, oh, they ain't never met Christ. In fact, the ones that twisted this gospel are the ones that ain't never met him and came in and twisted this stuff and taught it. That makes sense? It does. Okay. I think what we're running into is just a lot of, you know, church folk who need to know him. Church folks. They, you know, they're church. Yeah, they're church. They, 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 they haven't really given their lives to the yeah. Lord. And they follow in the Nicene Council, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church's fathers. I'm sorry, they're not the fathers of the faith. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Amen. Don't get mad at me because I'm telling you the truth. Love you. Amen. Okay, now, <clears throat> I read this scripture. Romans 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. You will never tap into this grace that I'm teaching about if you're in the wrong faith. It's by grace, by faith, through grace. Here's the faith that I'm talking about. Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul said, Okay, let me back to the verse 19. Paul said, for I through the law am dead to the law. He's talking about Moab. Not talking about he's dead to all law. See, they don't understand Paul. He said, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. But watch this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Paul stopped living by mutual faith and started living by the faith of Christ. So the reason many people can't find this grace that I'm teaching about is they are in their own human mutual faith trying to live for God. You have to have the faith of Christ. And the faith of Christ did always those things that pleased the Father. And he kept all the Father's commandments. So if you've got the faith of Christ talking about ain't no commandments, that faith didn't come from Christ. They in their own faith. So that's why I read this verse, Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Now, let me go show you Abraham walked in these laws that I'm talking about. It's a law of faith is what it is. Faith is a law. And that's what some people don't realize. Because uh, Romans chapter 3 said, uh, 3 verse 27 said, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? He's giving it a name. Two laws in this verse. By what law? Of works? That's a law of works. That's what you're free from. Law of works. He said, by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. The law of faith is the faith of Christ. And in the faith of Christ, the faith of Christ is the Father's commandments because it was the faith that came out of the Father on Mount Sinai. That covenant. Exodus 34, verse 24. Hallelujah. 
I think on uh, YouTube I said Exodus 34 verse 26, but I think I quoted it right that time. Exodus, somebody double check me on that. Exodus 34 verse 24, the Ten Commandments is the faith. And the Ten Commandments is the covenant. That was the faith that came out of the Father that Christ came and established in his life, his walk, and his teaching. And, and through that covenant, he kept everything else the Father said. Amen. Okay? So, what people don't realize is faith is a law. And with faith, Romans 3, I mean the faith, Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid so how you said he done away with his laws? Urban apologists? I stay on top of the urban apologists because they stay on top of Israel. Everybody in Israel is not on course. Amen? Glory to God. So it says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Through the faith, you establish God's law, not break them. Hallelujah. Now, uh, another verse Romans 5.23 watch this that as sin has reigned unto death even so might grace y'all see that do what I didn't give y'all a chance to find it Romans 5 verse 21 I want y'all to look at that because I'm, I'm going to need y'all to help me make my point here Romans 5 verse 21 when y'all get this say I got it okay watch this that sin, that as sin has reigned through death, even so might grace reign through what? Righteousness. Righteousness is a law. The law of righteousness. Yeah. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Righteousness is not standing over here without law. Righteousness is a law. The law of faith. That's good. But grace reigns through righteousness. Grace don't sit over here and reign by itself. Grace reigns through righteousness. So if you unrighteousness, grace not reigning. Mm, if you're living in unrighteousness, grace is not reigning in your life. That makes sense? Yes, you're living in unmerited favor, the worldly grace that y'all found outside this Bible. But this grace, this Bible talking about, which is the glory. And the, and the power that was in the Lord Jesus and on the Lord Jesus is the grace I'm teaching on. This stuff reigns through right living. <laughs> grace don't reign through unrighteousness. Grace don't reign through you sinning. So if you're sinning, you ain't in this grace. This grace reigns through righteousness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. So what does grace look like? Fulfilling the righteousness of the law. That makes sense? That's what grace look like. Now what kind of grace on your life and what do your, do your life look like? Hallelujah. Last two verses. Well, three verses. Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into grace. Watch this. Here is why people can't find this kind of grace I'm teaching on Sister Tammy. Because they don't access it by the faith of Christ. They trying to move in their own little mutual faith, puny faith. That's why they keep falling down and getting up. But when you move in the faith of Christ, you don't fall down and get up. You stand like he stood. Come on. So it says, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace. You got to have you have access to this power called grace through the faith of Christ. A lot of people just not in the faith of Christ. That's why they can't access this grace I'm teaching about. Hallelujah. Now, what does grace look like? Last two verses. Romans 6, 14 and 15. Here's for show a pretty portrait of grace. Beautiful portrait. In fact, this is going to be the best portrait you ever see in your life. Here's a picture of what grace looked like. Romans 6, 14 and 15. For sin shall not 
have dominion over you. When you live in a life where you dominate sin, and sin is not dominating you, that's grace. That's grace. And some people say, don't wear up, dominate just mean, don't do a lot of it, don't let it just control. No, no, no. One sin, no sin in your life. So what does grace look like? For well, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. But I'm talking about the grace that was in the Lord Jesus, on the Lord Jesus, that kept him doing always those things that please the Father. That's the grace when it's in you and on you, you dominate sin and don't dominate you. That's what grace looked like. All right. And that's how you know you really are under grace. Some people are not under law, we're under grace. Well, if you're under grace, why are you breaking the law? You're under grace, why are you teaching God down away with his laws? Them two don't go together. Somebody got it mixed up. Last verse, Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? <laughs> God like, what are you talking about? Where did you get that from? God forbid. So what does grace look like? God forbid you to sin and talk about you under grace. That's what grace looks like. That's right. Amen. Sister Tam, come give me the last words and kind of provoke thinking and kind of give me a few comments and you you close it out. Come on, give God praise. That's what grace looks like. What does grace look like? This message right here that come out of this Bible. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to the most high God. Amen. God for that word. Amen. Amen. What does grace look like? Amen. Amen. Grace looks like a life of sinless living. Amen. 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 That's what Amen. Grace Amen. Looks like. Say that one more time. Grace looks like a life of sinless Hallelujah. living. Amen. 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 So I just thank God for that word. It is an awesome word and it is just God you know, I just thank God for the teachings on Saturday because we get to eat. Amen. Yeah. We get to eat a full course meal spiritually. Amen. And so I just thank God for that because, you know, I I was kind of confused right now, <laughs> earlier in my walk, about, you know, the laws yeah. of, you know, being done away with the laws of Moses versus the laws of of God, and so when we under we were taught the Ten Commandments and how that God never done away with the Ten Commandments and the laws, the um in, in the Moab the Mosaic laws was different and how they was um, broke down. It just blessed me because I'm telling you, I thank God that we don't have to do, we don't have to live by those laws because I don't think we would have made it <laughs> if we had to live by those laws. So to, to live by those ten. It's a blessing. Amen. Amen. It's an honor. Hallelujah. But I just thank God for what grace looks like now. Hallelujah. And that's just living a life. And this Freedom because the priesthood was changed and Amen. the law, the focus right. on the law was changed. And like all of God's laws are good. But what we focusing right. on now is this eternal law that the Father spoke that whereby if you get this right, you won't have a problem with you nothing else the Father say. Amen. <laughs> so I just thank God for that. Amen. We don't have to live in garbage.